Welcome to Trinity Lutheran Church as we continue journeying through this beautiful season of Advent. There are postcards at the doorway and in the Jepson Hall. I think you all probably receive them at home as well. They indicate the worship schedule for these coming days of Christmas. If you happen to take 10 or 12 of these, you might give them to your friends and neighbors. Uh, we surely have plenty of them, and so uh, spread the word. You may also take note of the Christmas worship times as they are printed in the bulletin today uh, for your uh, uh, information. In our prayers today, we remember those families who are grieving the death of one whom they have loved. We pray for the family of Barbara Nyquet, the family of Dan Benoit, who is a friend of Judy Mansers, the family of Robert Wallet. Bob was the brother of our own Gordon Wallet, who often ushers here at Trinity, you know him well. And also the family of David Kilcoyne. We buried John Kilcoyne two Thursdays ago, but we buried David Kilcoyne on Friday, who died accidentally. And uh, we commend all the Kilcoyne family uh, to the merciful arms of God. And we commend all those who have died to the Lord who said, I am the resurrection and the life. I invite you now to stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we await the day of the Lord Jesus, let us confess our sin. Great and Holy One, in this time of waning daylight, we confess the shadows of sin in our lives. We build ourselves up at the expense of others. We rely on our own efforts to make our lives secure. Yet you, O oh Lord, are the potter, and we are the clay. Come to restore us in your image. Remake us into your people, and rebuild what sin has broken, that we in the whole creation may rejoice. Amen. Fear not, dear people of God. The Almighty has done great things for us. God casts away our sin and makes of us a new creation as a called and ordained servant of the Church of Christ and by his authority. I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. your power, Lord Christ, and come. With your abundant grace and might, free us from the sin that hinders our faith, that eagerly we may receive your promises. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Isaiah. The Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary mortals, that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son, and shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand, through his prophets and the holy scriptures, the gospel concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be son of God, with power according to the spirit of holiness. By resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for the sake of his name 
including yourselves who are called to, be to belong to Jesus Christ. To all God's beloved in Rome who are called to be saints, grace to you and peace from, uh, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory, Glory to, you, to you, O Lord. Lord. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Sisters and brothers, grace, peace, and mercy to you from God who is, who was, and who is to come. Amen. Amen. Well, late last week, I had something of a theological dilemma, I suppose you could call it, and it happened right here in this space. It was during a brief time of chapel with our preschool and their families during a Christmas celebration they had last Saturday. We were filling the stable, much as we just did, with the final major stars of the Nativity, and I introduced Mary and Joseph. In order to, I thought, make it easier for them to understand who I was holding in my hands, I said, and who were Jesus' mom and dad? As soon as I said it, my mind stopped, waiting to see what their response would be, praying that no one would say, well, the correct answer, that Jesus' father was God and not Joseph. But luckily, all went as planned and I did not have to stop and have a deeper theological discussion with these three, four, and five-year-olds about the incarnation and the virgin birth. Now flash forward to our gospel story this week 
and the most press that Jesus, or Joseph, Jesus' dad, gets in all of the Bible. And in this telling of the story by Matthew's gospel, for as little attention as he garners, Joseph plays quite a big role, not only in Jesus' birth, but in the whole act of God's coming to us in the Savior of the nations. If it weren't for Joseph in this telling of the story, after all, a man of whom we know very little, only that he's a descendant of David and a devout, compassionate, righteous person, if it weren't for this man who would adopt Jesus as his own, the Messiah might very well not have been born. Just imagine the torment that this devout, compassionate, and righteous man must have experienced when he learns that his soon-to-be wife is already pregnant. It certainly makes my own earlier theological dilemma seem quite elementary. It's true that many marriages in the first century were arranged, so Mary and Joseph probably were not middle school or elementary school crushes. But it's clear that Joseph did care deeply. Indeed, he loved Mary. And so even believing that she had been unfaithful to him, Joseph wanted to spare her as much humiliation and torment as he could, so much so that, in fact, that act itself is quite spectacular. And it does go on. As someone suggested in our weekly clergy discussion of these texts, Joseph stepped forward and was willing to shoulder the brunt of any possible criticism that might have come their way. By acknowledging Mary's child as his own, he very well may have led others to the conclusion that he could not wait to consummate their vows until their marriage day, essentially damaging his own reputation within society while protecting Mary's. And the impetus for this compassionate, this risky action was all based on a dream, on a dream. It is indeed difficult to grasp this story, in particular Joseph's reaction with our modern day logic. In our age of skepticism and doubt, we might hear a story about a virgin birth and a virgin conception as a great cover-up, calling into question not only Mary's fidelity, but her sanity as well, suggesting that it was by the Holy Spirit. And having heard such an outlandish story, how many of us would without question, if we heard in a dream that Mary's story was in fact true, accept it all. This was the act of the Holy Spirit, that it was all God's work. Yes, to us today, it quite clearly seems like an elaborate cover-up. And yes, as this Advent season winds up, as Christmas quickly approaches, we stand ready to celebrate this great moment that many in the world, perhaps even some here in this room, remain quite skeptical about. Skeptical about God coming into this world through a young, unwed, pregnant virgin. And even pondering what we through faith believe to be a wondrous miracle it's easy to see how Joseph had his doubts as well. But thankfully for us and for Joseph, the truthfulness of this story is that the reality of God's love for us and for the world does not hinge on our ability to believe. One commentator writes about the importance of understanding belief not to be intellectually making sense of the story, but rather trust trusting in our God who is our creator, our sustainer, and our redeemer. Trust is what Joseph was able to fall back on, his trust in a faithful and loving God. In fact, Joseph was just beginning to see the mysterious and wholly illogical to us ways in which God worked and continues to work in this world. The fact is that God most certainly could have chosen to reveal God's self to be fully incarnated in any way that God chose. 
for the creator of the stars and the seas, of the plants and trees and every human being, our own human logic would think God would reveal God's self in an equally majestic and awe-inspiring way. And yet, against all human logic, far beyond our understanding, God chose this way. So while some attempt to explain the incarnation of God becoming flesh away with many, many theories, theories about what really happened, even the most logical theories are our desperate attempt to grasp the Creator, to make sense of an act that we just cannot make sense of. After all, did Joseph ever fully understand the news that he had received? Or did Mary ever fully understand the manner in which God was working quite literally in and through her own body? And can we ever fully understand God's work in and through our own lives? Joseph placed his trust in God's word, in God's promise, in the word that his soon-to-be wife would bear into this world. And in his actions, in his faithfulness to his God, Joseph made way for God's great coming into this world. He paved the way for the night in which we celebrate in just a few short days. This young carpenter who trusted in God's wisdom, as ridiculous as it sounded, Joseph trusted God, trusted that God was doing great things through himself and his beloved family. And this foolish wisdom, this illogical logic of God's, is what we eagerly await this day. What we trust in wholeheartedly, even as we look beyond his birth. Because we know how the story continues. Even before Christ is born with Paul, we know, we trust, that the fullness of God's love does not end there on the in the manger on Christmas night. Even on this final Sunday in Advent, while we wait for Jesus' birth because of God's mysterious ways, we are already looking to the end. To the end, we are already proclaiming his death on the cross, his blood poured out for our sake and for the sake of the world. This is the mystery of faith, the fact that we are still an Easter people. Daily, we celebrate that mark that was made on each of us when we joined this community, that cross of Christ which would mark the end of Jesus' earthly life. We are marked by the Holy Spirit forever, which means each and every day, every day in Advent, in Christmas, in Lent, throughout ordinary time. We continue to proclaim this God, this God who comes to us in the infant Jesus, who dies for us on the cross, who through the, his resurrection, we too gain eternal life, and who continues to puzzle us every day, living among us in the most extraordinary places, the last places we would ever think to look. And so on street corners, in slums, in schools, in our office buildings, in grocery stores, department stores, and yes, even in the mall during this holiday season, even in a lowly manger. This is the confounding lodge of a God. This is where God meets us. Just as God entered into our world through that humble, scandalous birth of Jesus in the stable to a not-quite-wed mother, to his life sharing meals with the least, with tax collectors, prostitutes, and children, and finally to his death among criminals on the cross. God meets us in these places, meets the world in need of hope, in need of joy, in need of light, in need of the very light of the Christ. In this season of great expectation, of anticipation of hope, God meets us with a gift beyond our wildest, most outlandish dreams. Because where we should meet punishment, exile, even death, God instead meets us with complete forgiveness of all of our sins and extends to us the promise of everlasting life. 
and so with Sarah and Abraham, with Mary and Joseph, with our mothers and fathers and the saints of all times who have gone before us. We have sat and waited and watched to see what God has done and what God is doing and what God will continue to do in, with, and through our lives. And so we continue to huddle together and wait with all of creation in the darkness, wait for this great, wondrously odd story to play out, wait longingly, hopefully, joyfully, and yes, even at times struggling with our own disbelief. Because after all, the only explanation that we have The only explanation that we need is God's unexpected and mysterious love for us, for you, for me, for the whole world. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
In hope and anticipation, we pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. Continue to restore and give life to the people of your covenant established in Christ. Use our presence in the world to reveal your salvation for all people. Let us pray. Reveal your light to those who dwell in darkness during this season. Awaken all creation to the hope of new life through your promised coming. Let us pray. Secure your grace and your peace among the nations. Lead us in the ways of unity and justice to work with one another for the sake of all people. Let us pray. Deliver the hope of Emmanuel, God with us, to all who suffer loneliness and despair. Send your spirit to accompany those who long for your healing. Let us pray. We give thanks that you welcome the saints into your eternal dwelling place, especially David and Daniel, Barbara and Robert. Train us to look forward to the day when you come to dwell among us and all your people for all time. Let us pray. Almighty God, we entrust you all for whom we pray, confident that you fulfill your promises through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you.
Let us pray. God of abundance, we bring before you the precious fruits of your creation, and with them our very lives. Teach us patience and hope as we care for all those in need until the coming of your Son, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You comforted your people with the promise of the Redeemer, through whom you will also make all things new in the day when he comes to judge the world in righteousness. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy God, the beginning and the end, our salvation and our hope. We praise you for creating a world of order and beauty. When we brought on chaos, cruelty, and despair, you sent the prophets to proclaim your justice and your mercy. At this end of all the ages, your Son, Jesus Christ, came to bring to us your love and to heal all the suffering world. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his life, death, and resurrection, we await his coming again in righteousness and in peace. Send your spirit upon us, and upon this bread and wine we share. Strengthen our faith, increase our hope, and bring to birth the justice and joy of your Son. Through him, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in
living in hope, now come to the table of the Lord Jesus.
The body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. God of wonder, we give thanks that you have fed us once again. With this foretaste of the great feast to come, strengthen us with this gift to serve our neighbor with joy, that all may come to see your glory reflected in the lives of your people through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.